Go Loud presents the Talking Bollocks podcast. The hip knocker. Boom! Episode 59 of the Talking Bollocks podcast brought to you by Go Loud, the home of Irish podcast. It's me, Terry Flower. It's me, COB. And this week we're joined by... Darren Lawler. Darren, how are you, pal? Oh, I'm great, buddy. How are you? All good, all <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, for us is a flower. We've big news for you there, yeah? Calvin, take her away. <laughs> Absolutely, Grant. Hand one over to me. <laughs> so you've asked and we have delivered. We are doing a live show Friday the 4th of March, Liberty Hall. Tickets go on sale on the 7th of February, Monday the 7th of February, but the pre-sale link is available now. Sign up to the pre-sale link to increase your chances of getting tickets, but you cannot guarantee that you will get a ticket for, uh, from pre-sale. Yeah. My nerves are gone. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be our first live show. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. We have a few tricks up our sleeve. We might bring a guest. We might not. We might, we might bring a few. Oh, we'll, we'll see that. what happens. We'll see. We don't, <laughs> do you know what? We keep the cards close to our chest. Yeah, we don't say too much, but well, you just have to be there and see what happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're liable to bleed and to do something stupid, so you'll have to come and see us, especially for the first one. Oh, no. Because whatever mistake we make in the first one, we're not going to do in the second one. Well, I'll hope so. Hopefully, no mistakes. Just well, sure, look. Real, to get me. Yeah. My nerves still be gone. My nerves are gone now, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Give me great. Stop, will you? <laughs> Well, oh, sure, look. Friends, that's being said, Yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Imagine was, uh, everyone just had lunch and things out of his mouth. Get <laughs> off the stage. He's adored. Yeah, he's yeah. yeah. <laughs> adored. Right. We'll jump into the single stamp last yeah. week. Yeah. Darden, have you ever listened to an episode of this? I have listened to part of Arlo Handlin and Jim Sheridan. Yeah, the boys. Hmm. The lads. So we do a thing called singers, yeah? yeah. There's like an either or, a would you rather, mm-hmm. stupid things. We're at our wits end with them, yeah? So, mm. the ones from last week, the results. How, what way do you put your cutlery in the dishwasher? Face down, face up. Oh, jeez, I just throw it in. Yeah. It's working, the dishwasher's not working, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Calvin, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I just throw them in, but a lot of people were messaging us saying you should put them face down because uh, if you open it and someone could fall on it. What? Who the fuck decides? Do you know what? The dishwasher's open there. I'm going to start doing 100 meter hurdles out in the <laughs> kitchen. Like, who's running around the kitchen when the dishwasher is open? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but you can just fall, no? Oh, come on. I think people are doing, being too overcautious. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Put them face down in case someone falls on them. What? But uh, apparently there's an episode of EastEnders where someone fell... A, a husband pushed on she fell on a knife that was in the dishwasher sticking up or something like that so it, I don't know look it makes sense and all but like he's a what are you going to be doing you might as well walk around your guy for a helmet on if you're going to be that careful you know what I mean <laughs> anyways the results 53% do them facing up and yeah, so 47% put them in facing down half and half yeah, yeah. we we'll just throw them in yeah and people are saying that they sort them out and all spoons and one knives and the other just, everything get in there once it's all in there it's clean isn't it valid point Right, the second thing. In the chipper, do you say the plural version? So if you are saying garlic and cheese chips, would you say garlic and cheese chip or chips? Or oh, chips, definitely, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'd, yeah. Say, I'd say a garlic and cheese chip yeah. or a fish and chip. Yes, it's weird. because No, I'd say chips. Yeah, because you expect the one chip. The one chip, they'll yeah. just give you the one chip. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like in England they say 50 pounds they say no 50 pounds pounds, pounds yeah. better you feel yeah. like you're loaded yeah. <laughs> yeah. someone messaged us and said that uh, he was in Australia with his missus and she said uh, they were ordering off a menu and he said oh yeah and can I get a chicken nugget as well and he came out and gave her one chicken nugget because <laughs> what she meant was a portion of chicken nuggets like a chicken nugget and he came out and gave her one chicken nugget he's a legend for that well yeah well that's what you're asked for isn't it a it's like that nugget. one um, it, when, it, when I'm in work and you're reading like a requirements doc, right? It has to be like people interpret things differently. So there's an old one when we were in there, when we were getting trained in. An example to use is a mother sent her son to the shop and says, Get eggs. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Get milk. And if there's eggs, get six. So get a bottle of milk. And if there's eggs, get six. And he comes back with six bottles of milk and goes, They had eggs. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? I it's how it's interpreted. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I get do that just to annoy you. Yeah, yeah. Just, just get a six eggs. We'll get you the six eggs. Get me one chip. I'll come back with well, one, one chip. Yeah, that's what yeah. you're asked for. Yeah. So. <laughs> the results: eighty-one percent would say the plural version. Yeah, because they're right. And then ninety-eight percent would say a chip. Yeah, so 
Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. Zinger's boxed off. I don't have a zinger for this week. I have one and it's a bit childish. So, but apparently it's it's the voice of, so you know, uh, you know that Ryan, this little piggy went to the market. Yeah. You know that one? Mm-hmm. And this little piggy said at home, mm-hmm. what did the next piggy have? This little piggy had roast beef. I don't know. I say bread and butter. And this oh, little yeah. piggy had none. Yeah. Is it? So apparently this is the thing. Uh, and some, is that the answer you were looking for him to say? Yeah. Yeah, you some people say roast beef. Oh, very good. Yeah, some people say roast beef, but some people say bread and butter. So do you say bread and butter or do you say roast beef? Look at what fifty what nine episodes in. I'm struggling, I think. Yeah. This mu- we're, like, we're close. We're close to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Ryan Bowles and anyway, so sending me that one. He's from Rings End and his board's on Fingless, and he said there's be trouble with that. I'm from Fingless. So it could be a Fingless thing, actually. Yeah, it could be a Fingless thing. But uh, yeah, I think what in the last couple. Of Yogs with Zingers. Of that podcasts bad. With zingers. Bad. Yeah. Have yeah. you got one, Darden? No. No, the funny one that somebody said, a weird one, is that if you're in the shower, do you wash your hair first or do you wash your body first? Oh, that's actually, that's actually not a bad thing. I wash yeah. my hair first. Yeah. yeah I, I wash my hair think, first. Something's something stepping in. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, I wash my hair I first. Wash my yeah. hair first. Yeah, yeah hair's yeah. the first thing to get wet, no? Yeah. When you think about it, yeah. 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 Well, it's a question you have to think about, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is, yeah. That's not bad. Yeah, that's something not bad. you have to think about. You yeah. came in here prepared, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, to, yeah. love that, love that. And I don't have much hair, look. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well. What? You're doing well. I know. I yeah. know, I'm fellas. Kind of move her over this side yeah. of it, yeah. Fellas, half your age with a quarter of the hair. <laughs> 25, 50 this year, man. Mm. Love it. Right. Something we forgot to mention. So, when the tickets go on sale, they're going to be 20 euro each. Including uh, and booking fee. And then there'll be a booking fee with it. Right, so book there'll be a hall door and book and fee. And book and fee, yeah, so just, that's it. Keep Sug- that in mind. Yeah, suggestions. Uh, 20 euro is actually a great price as well. Yeah. Just saying, you know what I mean? So people have, sorry. It's a round figure. Yeah, I yeah. think it's reasonable. A score? Yeah, yeah. it's a round hall figure, door. yeah. Bleeding 20, blow for a score. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Smokes are about bleeding 21 euro or something. Yeah, yep. long like a cocoa pop. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, some people, uh Sent us in a couple of questions. They want to know who books the guests and how do we get the guests? Both of us, both of us. Oh, I mean, <laughs> both of us and go loud. Yeah. So like, there's a mixed bag. Yeah. So we have to say on the guests, but that's on, that doesn't mean that we say get us this person and they come in. Uh, the lads do suggest people for us. Like it's a team effort here. You know what I mean? Everyone has to pull that way. Yeah. So we would say. Can you get us X, Y, or Z? Because the lads might have a better reach than us, or we might know them. And if you go through the guests that we've had, we, we do actually know most of them directly. Yeah. And we just send them a message, ask them, do you want to come on? Or sometimes the lads and go loud will send a message for us. Like Darren, that's how we got you in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. But they just suggest them sometimes. Some, they say, lads, what do you think of this person, that person, that person? Yeah. we'll be like, no, no, sounds good. Yeah, or whatever, yeah. yeah. But we do still pick the guests because I know a lot of people are getting very snipey and narky about us saying like, oh, you can tell who's picking the guests. We pick the guests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's always been like that. Would there, yeah. be any somebody, would there be any time somebody would say, no, we don't want him on or we don't want her on? All the time. Happen, yeah. <laughs> Last oh, week. Yeah. <laughs> this week. Yeah. <laughs> don't bring him on. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, no, I'm only messing. No, it's not like that, but uh, we, we sat in Terrence, we chatting like, we think this person could be good. and Like, even if the other one is hesitant, you just g- give your points across. Saying, yeah. Look, this person would be good because this, this, and this. They stand for that, and this would be good, and the usual carry on. You go with that, yeah. So, but yeah, we, we still have the final say mm-hmm. before but the trigger is pulled. is good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You're kind of unsure you're going, is that the best gamble? Mm. Yeah. Or is that not the best gamble? In fairness, and there's been a lot of them where we'd be like, I don't know, will, will this be good? And they've turned out to be exceptional. Yeah. Like, there's loads of them where you'd be like, oh, I can't believe how well that went, considering, yeah. like, we were hesitant about getting them on. Definitely. You know? Definitely. Um, and then another question someone said is, would you have somebody from the third floor on? I always said no, because we're not allowed down on the third floor. They shouldn't be allowed up here. Yeah, but we're not allowed down because of our antics. Yeah, but like, it doesn't matter. You don't realise how loud we are. It's actually a joke. Like, yeah. As soon as we come in, like everyone's like, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. But what's the third floor? <laughs> So uh, we're on the fifth floor yeah. now. The third floor is on news talk, talk and, and oh, the professionals and all. Yeah. See, so the only third floor I knew was when my auntie lived in Ballymun. Yeah. yeah. You, know? you don't want to go and there either. The English, you only have two floors upstairs, downstairs. We don't have a third floor. Yeah. 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 No, the third floor in this gaff. Ah, stop. Yeah, big business getting done down there, you know what I mean? I think they have a bouncer on the stairs, you know what I mean? Sorry, so lads, not tonight. No. no, we're not allowed. But uh, do you know, I, might, I actually agree with them. 
Yeah, are they right? Yeah, they're bloody neck boys. We they'll be screaming, shouting. I'm going, I'm going down that whole floor after this. Oh, you're looking not going down now because I heard a rumor going around. Hey, mugs are down there. Are we allowed to talk about this? Because we, kick we can talk about it. No names, no names mentioned, right? Is that your mugs is in your face or your mugs is in your mugs? <laughs> <laughs> and mugs yeah, that, that keep away. Yeah, yeah. Don't let them in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had mugs, personalized mugs. Me and Terence have yeah, air names and the logo were on them. And we brought them over, and that was grand. Everything was great for a few weeks, and then just one day they went missing, and we kind of let it slide, didn't we? And we didn't really no, didn't know, didn't. did we not know? We made me cause murder. No, I have enjoyed the makers look real nice. That we were like, where's your mugs? We were refusing to do a podcast and all, but we didn't get them. I didn't get them back. No, but we still we did. did. We, we did, did get them back today. Yeah, we we did get them back. What did you wait for? <laughs> a that? big fucking herd in the time. Yeah, we we did. Uh, we got the Mac eventually, and then he went missing again. But I don't know how did we how did we not get good murder the second time then? I think we were over it. But what, we should be the one yeah. stroking. I think it's an insult. I think that's somebody acting a bollocks for us because they personalised mug. So it's not as if you're using it by accident. They know who owns that mug. Has your fucking name, Johnny? That's what I'm saying. Has that logo we, and our name? So they know. Is it not secretly an invite to come to the third floor? That's it's a, it could be a setup. Yeah, I think. A Trojan horse yeah, kind of thing. Come down yeah. to the third floor. Yeah, yeah handcuffed. Back. Get them out here to our acting a bollocks on the third floor. Pat yeah. Kenny lumping the head off the third floor. So you have to stage one Pat Kenny show to get mm. your mugs back. We're gonna. I'll just walk into the middle of news talk. Sorry, I'm looking for a couple of mugs. Or oh, I found a few. Yeah, I walk out. Talking <laughs> <laughs> with the dad jokes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but this is just a little message. Yeah, bring our mugs back. Or else. And that's it. Or else you'll be down looking for them. That's it. Yeah. That, that's that. <laughs> that's that. Suggestions done. Yeah. Uh, no real questions this week. A lot of just yeah, went, went in it. See, when we, we put the yoke up on uh, the Instagram on the Talking Bollocks Instagram on a Sunday saying suggestions and people just keep writing and they use that great just do it just went to a live show and all yeah, yeah we're like no the hell is something to talk about yeah. <laughs> we don't know we, you should yeah. do the greatest hits of all your show not about on a Saturday they have like an RTE I'm and telling you a load of bollocks I'm, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm telling you just on the the ball. no the I don't think so do, was somebody onto you because huh? there's a leak in, it, in this building. Every time I come up with something, <laughs> on the next episode, somebody talks about it. Happened in the McGuckin episode. It happened a few times. With the film club, remember? I think someone tapped my phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You? yeah. Because yeah. Calvin literally only said this to me last week, that we should do something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's a great... Yeah, why not? They were run through of all the episodes, they were play run by all play. The episode, let everybody see who you had on, mm. you know, except for your mugs. Yeah. 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 Your poor mugs. So we're going to get them back, I'm telling you. I'm gonna yeah. get, it's like taken. It is. You know what I mean? There's going to be slaughter on her. Particular, se- particular set of skills. Yeah. Fact. So, suggestions boxed off. As I said, send us in actual things you want us to talk about. Do you get me? Mm. Darren. Yeah. Into yourself, pal. Before, so what we do with all, I guess we just got back to the start. Mm-hmm. Tell us what life was like growing up, blah, 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 where you're from and all. But before we do that, Tell us what you actually do first. Yeah. What I actually do first. Because yeah. people might be looking at this saying, who's your man? Yeah. I'd be looking at myself saying, who's your man? <laughs> but, do you know what? Actually, if someone recognises you because of what your profession is, I'd be wary of them if they're able to say, oh, that's, I know him. And I'd be like, right, he's a bogey then. <laughs> the other previous guests would be looking at yeah. him. He's all right yeah, him. He's a good kid. Members of my family would be going, that's your man. <laughs> um, I'm a barrister at law. So I practice law, mainly crime, mainly in crime. Lovely. Really? Since 2015. Good contact to have. Yeah. yeah. Good contact to have, yeah. And I just kind of... I could say I was made to do it. I was As in, like, you were built for it? No, I was made. Oh, you were pushed me, into yeah. doing it all right. <laughs> she, she was my wife at the time, and she suggested, oh, she said, I think you should do law medicine. And I was going, like, she's off her head. Law medicine? I was ringing me, mate. She's telling me what to do already. <laughs> and the, uh, so she said, come on. She said, um, you should go back and study law. So I was in a different career at the time. And the... Uh, so we listened to her and I went in and started a law degree in DBS and it went seriously wrong from there on in. So the, uh, and that's how it began. I met a friend in there who's a guard and the, uh, we became really good pals. And he said near the end of the law degree, come on, we become barristers, he said. And I was going, this bloke's off his head. Me, a barrister. And I went home, said it to Fiona, he wants me to become a barrister. Oh, you'd be great, she said. And we went and did the exams. I think it was 2012 and we failed the exams. There were entrance exams, you had to do five of them. And we failed, and myself and Fergal. And I was driving a taxi at the time, and I went out that Friday night, you know, depressed. Oh, but I think about the failing my exams, you know. You had to wait a while for the results. And the first ferry I got was on George's Street, and dropped a lady, I think it was, to 
Rap Mines, I think it was, or Ranela, I think it was Ranela. And she, she ran off real pain me, you know? I <laughs> Legend. I remember, <laughs> and I was going, I've run out and I'll kill her. And I seen these guards and I said, your woman's not out to pain me. And he says, oh, there's nothing we can do. I said, you can't, I said. I said, it's a section A making off real pain. How did you know? I just sent me entrance exam for the King's Inns. So they ran after your woman anyway, but look, I, we just mm. let her away with it. And uh, so the following year, we set the exams and we get in, you know, mm. and we spent two years in the King's Inn. So that's yeah. how I ended up in there. We'll get around to all that. Yeah. yeah. That was just a little teaser. Yeah. 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 Just real quick, I want to call you out on something. You said it was a Section 8, not paying. Is Section 8 not public order? No, that's Public Order Act. Yeah, that's a different so one. two different this things. This was the Teflon Fraud Defences Act. Yeah, yeah, there's two different ones. Yeah. two different Section 8s. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's loads of different sections. sections yeah, yeah. yeah. And the worst thing was, I was thinking out tonight, they start asking me about the sections of law. People would be thinking, he knows nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What section 10? Section 10, I don't know. Right. Have to look section, right. what? Oh. section 10 of what though? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Just, yeah. I just, I have yeah. to look it up. Oh, section 8 of the Public Order Act, you have to leave the area, blah, blah, blah. But was that not if you were suspected of doing a crime? If you're suspected of doing something funny, yeah. Yeah. Suspected of doing a crime. And how would you know that? How do I know that? Because I looked her up because I know from standing in a park, a public park, a guard came in and he says, you all have to live under Section 8 of the Public Order Act. Mm -hmm. And someone said, for what? And he said, loitering. And he said, well, how can you be loitering? We're in a public park. Mm -hmm. Entitled to be here. Mm -hmm. And the guard done the U-turn and walked right back out. Mm -hmm. Very good point. So I looked her up because I was... Yeah, but just be standing around and the guard comes over section eight, you just have to know. Been what? hit with it a thousand times. But what, like, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah, that's, I looked her up and I was like, right, you can't just come over and tell people to live and then it's, it's, unless you're suspected of uh, committing a crime. And did you look her up on the internet? Uh, yeah. Yeah, interesting. The internet, you can find anything you want. Anything having. in the world. Anything you want. Incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. But I made sure, like, it wasn't on bleeding, like, Wikipedia or something. Mm -hmm. It was in, like, the, <laughs> yeah. the proper, yeah. the proper You find dodgy things on Wikipedia. Voice or something yeah, or dodgy section 8 on Wikipedia, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, but, you know, it's nice to know that because mm. then you don't want guys just coming over for the sake of it and saying a random law and you thinking, oh, I haven't got the right to be standing here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, unless you're suspected of doing a crime or about to commit a crime mm -hmm. or, you know, like that. It's basically being suspicious. Mm -hmm. So it's always nice to know the law because mm -hmm. then, you know, you can't get yourself caught out. Mm hmm Oh, grand little lesson there off the CO, yeah. babe. Well, I'm a, I'm a you should be coming into the courts now tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you be coming in in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> is that we asked you to section 10, is it? No, well, that's yeah, why we yeah. got that's you That's why we got you wrong. We're looking to get yeah. you to do a Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Oh, stop playing. So wet, boys. Right, Darden, into yourself. Watch your name. Where did you come from and what was life like growing up? What's my name? Okay, Darren Lawler is my name and it's yeah. L-A-L-O-R. And everybody called me Dazzler or Darren and, you know, D or all other names, but never really, or Lawler. What's the story, Lawler, you know? <clears throat> so they never really called me Darren Lawler. Um, so I'm from Finglas. Uh, I moved to Finglas, I think, when I was two. My mum and dad had a flat on the North Circular Road and we moved to Finglas when I was two. Ballygall prayed. And then when I was 12, then we moved down to Griffith Close. And so I remained in Griffith Close until about, geez, I think it was 2009. And I moved to with Fiona then. And then just life just took over, you know, as simple as that. What was life like growing up? Uh, it was interesting because up in Ballygall Parade, like the, the people I grew up in Ballygall Parade were the same people I grew up in Griffith Close. But just then we met other people as well. So we, we've kind of been around the same people all the time, you know. And it was interesting, like I was always into dogs and music and, you know, contraption speakers and radios and wondering how things always worked. And uh, I always put my mind into that, but big into football. I um, was never really into going to pubs and, you know, kind of hanging around corners or drinking around like that. I just never really drank, you know. But life was okay growing up. Sometimes be difficult because the... Uh, You'd be kind of trying to find things to do, but we always played football or we always, um, we always got up to things. I had a video camera and myself and my friend Scott Dunn used to go around making videos, you know, and uh, we used to go on long walks with dogs. So we, we just kind of made the most of the time that we had and we had plenty of time to make the most of, you know. Yeah. Not what were you like? Or nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's different back then. What were you like in school? I don't know. I think I left school at 14. What was I like in school? I was interested in school, um... But I just left at 14, I was in Benevolent College. I started in the De La Salle. Well, Mother Divine Grace made me communion, went to the De La Salle, and then we went to Benevolent College. And everybody thought, oh, Benevolent College, you must be loaded. It was just the secondary part of the De La Salle. And I think I left there when I was 14. Why? I don't know. 
I don't know why. Just, up one morning, yeah, Jeff, fuck okay, this. Well, I, had a, <laughs> yeah, I kind of had a job, like, you know, I was doing the job, like, you know, working on a milk round and vegetable rounds, and I just didn't go to school. I just thought, like, you know, I've, I've other business to do out there. But what don't the business need to go was, to school, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I thought. And I was yeah. thinking, oh, I don't need to go to school. I've other things to be doing. But I didn't know where, what I had to be doing, you know. But still, yeah. I had a big graph of music, always into music. And it was always trying to head in that direction. You know, so I left school at 14 and started working vegetable rounds, milk rounds, um, coal rounds. You know, always working for people. Yeah. You know, low wage jobs, yeah. And how long did you do that for then? Oh, on and off, I think until. I'm only guessing until I was about 16. Uh, this guy called John B. Heaslip, he owned a shop down near the cream or where we lived. And he always said to me, um, if you go to Foss, he says, I'll get you a good job. So I listened to him and I went into Foss and he got me a job in uh, Presco. Um, and I remained there for, I think it was over 10 years of my life. And I, you know, I never, I learned how to do things, but I never learned to craft. I never went to school. I never went to college. You always kind of had that self-doubt, like, oh, this is for other people, you know? And sometimes other people would let you know. Yeah. You know, oh, look, you're a laborer. This is what you do. And other people would try and encourage you. Um, but I, I did like milk rounds and vegetable rounds and I was kind of mixing and matching things like through my life. So I couldn't put an exact, an exact time, but I, I really ended up, I think, in a normal job around the age of maybe 18 or 19, maybe a little bit earlier than that, you know, a normal nine to five job. Yeah. yeah. So then talk, talk to us then. So you've worked a lot of jobs. My jobs. Yeah, I was milk round, coal round, vegetable round, um, used to hold a sign for a place called Mary Bowers and uh, what was it in um, Henry Street? I used to sell posters in Henry Street. Um, <laughs> mad jobs, like, you know? And I was always into something, always trying to keep work on. But the, uh, I never really like held a proper job down until I went to Presco for 10 years. And the, um, so then I very slowly start falling into music. You know, I wanted to be a weightlifter and a powerlifter. I was interested with the Hulk and I went off and I did that. So I used to go to the gym all the time. And I met this guy called Alan McAdams. He's a bass player. And he told me he was in a band. And then we just became friends. And I had a video camera. We went to video them one night in Barnstormers, this mad place with all hippies and rockers. And I just thought I was on a different planet, like, you know. And uh, my interest in music just kind of took off from there, you know. And I was... Um, Alan's band had split up Shrine and I was going, oh, this is me out letting music on. And then Kieran went out on his own, the singer, and he asked me, would I manage him? And I was going, like, manage him? Sure, I'm God. I don't know, end about managing him. And he said, look, I'll give you two numbers, he said. Here's Chrissy Diggins' number, El Vazlan and Tony McGuinness's number. And the music things just kind of took off from there. Still held a day job, but the music was kind of like the big passion and hobby on the side, you know? And had the lads took off then? Oh. Well, Shrine won the um, Battle of the Bands on 2FM. And the, uh, they were really good. But I, I think they felt they took it as far as they could. They had interest in the UK. And they were kind of let down by managers and people who were promising them this and promising them that. And the, uh, But Kieran had a great voice. And he um, teamed up with a guy called Stephen Vickers. And they wanted to get into a place called the, um, the Da Club. They always wanted to play these type of venues. And I didn't know what the Da Club was. And then I found it was a place where people drink wine up an alleyway just around the corner from here. And the, um, so they asked me to manage them, but they wanted the Aslan gigs. They wanted to support Aslan to get that recognition. And the, um, so Kieran and Stephen went as far as they could. And then I was doing the, the Aslan gigs with them. And Alan Downey set me one day up in the Fingal. He said, look, we're looking for a roadie. And he said, would you like to be the roadie for Aslan? And I was going, <laughs> me. I said, a roadie? He said, yeah, you'd be great. He said, we'll take it under our wing and we'll sort you out and, you know, put you on the right track. Mm. And that's where the music end took off, you know. But still, I had left school early, no education. Yeah. You know, so all these hopes and dreams, but nothing to back it up. Yeah. You know? And you're on like a world tour with Aslan, is it? Well, we did, um, <coughs> we're Aslan, we went to Australia, we were in Spain, um, we were in France, we went to Jersey, you know, so we were kind of all over the place. Yeah. Australia was the furthest we ever went, you know, and the, um, so Aslan I started with Here Comes Lucy Jones, just when the album was coming out, and I finished just before um, Waiting for This Madness to End, that was just being released, so I think I was there for four or five albums, but I think it was four albums, Made in Dublin, Waiting for This Madness to End, and the... Um, Classics. Oh, great albums. Mm. And it was a great time, you know, to go in, like I was very young, I was... Um, 
I think it was 26, but very young in my mind. And suddenly I was launched into this kind of um, very, very public arena with Aslan and keeping my day job at the same time. Yeah. You know, trying to balance two things, afraid to give it a full time thing just in case it went wrong. Yeah. And yeah, um, but it was great. Absolutely great. Mm. Dream come true. I say you have some stories from that. Oh, come here. Like, you know, I was idolized Chrissy Dingham growing up. Yeah. Great storyteller. The way he could go on stage, tell a story. And when you listen to the songs, you go, Jesus, he's singing about me. Are you singing about the girl next door? Are you singing about, you know? And you're just always kind of, it's just a passion everybody could relate to him. But to be asked, I'll be the roadie. And I go, this is nuts. And um, Joe would give me his guitar. I'd go home, take it apart, put it back together, bring it in from the next day. And he'd look and say, oh no, this is off or that is off, you know? And it just took off from there. But you, it, it took a while to kind of, find your feet, what your job was, what you were meant to do. So I started off as the, the road, you know, taking the gear in, setting it up, and then production manager then, which involved the same things, but you were kind of buying and selling um, all their, their uh, equipment and getting endorsements and booking the support bands, you know? And the stories were absolutely crazy, you know, absolutely crazy things happened on the road. Things you could never, I, I think I you could imagine. I was going to say, in there, but yeah. you're sitting there saying, no huh? comment, what? Yeah. No, the thing, like we used to arrive in, um, Aslan used to play every nook and cranny of the country. You yeah. know, Larkin Ennis was their man. Still do. Oh, they still do. And Larkin was their man. He, his view was, was like, you know, go see the people. Instead of having one gig in the Point or one in the Olympia, you know, go to all the nooks and crannies around the country, you know. And we were all over the place. We were up in, um, <laughs> I was saying when your colleagues this, and I'd probably get slated by this poor blind fella down in Cute Hill. We were in Cute Hill and the um, Jerry Quinn was the other roadie, you know. And myself and Jerry didn't always get on, but we worked brilliantly together. You know, if Jerry was your backup man, any gig you were doing, Jerry was the guy to have with you, you know. And the, um, I was kind of more, a little bit more technically minded than he was, but he had a great kind of, um, a great street cred, you know. He kind of, um, he just knew how things worked, you know. And we were down in um, Cute Hill one time, and the, um, it was a small little town, and this guy used to have a living room, and it was called the venue. So the living room with the house was the venue. So people would come from all over the place to see Aslan, and they'd be looking in through the windows. And we were down there one time, and this, um, we noticed this guy was sitting down with glasses on, he had a pair of sunglasses. And um, I thought it was one of the lads from Westlife, just seeing your man sitting down, and Jerry said, uh, he goes, look at your man over there with the glasses, you know. So Jerry's packing up the gear and he says, um, he goes, you must be expecting the sun, are you? <laughs> and your man goes, what? You must be expecting the sun. And he goes, uh, no, no. He says, I'm blind, like, you know. And I was going, oh, Jesus, oh. you know. So Jerry had to go up and say to the manager, Jesus, look. He says, um, I'm not insulting your man over there. He's blind. I didn't know. I thought he was one of the lads out of Westlife, you know. So the Larkin goes, you better give him some, give him some merchandise. So Jerry goes back and gives your man a CD and a book, you know. <laughs> so he hands your man the book and he says, uh, oh, look, I'll get one of my mates to read it to me after, like, you know. Uh -oh. So there are funny stories, you know, I mean, obviously not funny for, uh, <laughs> you know, you be very careful what you say, but things like that, yeah. you know, very innocent things that can go wrong. But that was just one of the many, um, mm. One of the, a lot of them will come to my mind now. Yeah, I say, I'll probably be able to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we had Christy on. We went up and uh, we actually done an episode in his gaff. He's great, isn't he? Yeah, he invited us in. So yeah, give a shout out to Christy. Yeah, Christy is a legend. That's what we were saying. Be great to get Christy in out to the studio. Because one thing we regretted was not hearing him singing. Like in front of us, we'd have loved to get him to sing on that podcast, mm -hmm. but we never got him to sing. Yeah. He coined the bottle, didn't we? Yeah, like, we, we were like, oh, we'll ask him, we'll ask him. Well, we'll if we were in his gap. house, yeah. yeah. You know what but I mean? You don't want to ask when him. You hear that, when you hear Christy open his mouth, I don't mean like open his mouth, but when he when he just sings, it's just that rawness and just that passion, like, you know, it's, it's absolutely incredible mm. just to actually see somebody, like, deliver something, whether he's written it or not, just the way he can you know, uh, take somebody else's work or even take his own work and deliver it in such a way that everybody gets it, you know? And it's a very, um, it's a very unusual talent to have, but to actually work with somebody who you were a fan of for years. Um, I remember one time I was in a work in my day job and this girl rings me, Sarah McQuill, and she was crying. She said, did you hear Christy's dead? I said, Christy's? No, Jesus, no. I said, she's better not be. He said, he owes me money. I said, he's dead. And she says, he's dead. So she the, say he owes me money. Yeah, he owes me money. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
and I remember like Larkin Ennis, the manager, ringing me. He goes, uh, are you getting phone calls that Christy is dead? I said, jeez, everybody's ringing me. He said, jeez, I've MCD on to me and all, like wondering what's going on, you know? So he said, look, if you hear anything, he says, give me a shout. So I keep on ringing him, Larkin. I said, there's no answer to the phone. So eventually got through to Christy. And he goes, look, are you hearing and I'm dead? I said, yeah, everybody. He said, I'm not dead. I said, well, obviously you're not, you know? <laughs> so we didn't know what was going on because Jerry Ryan was on that morning. And he goes, I'm not hearing sad news. Um, we'll confirm it just after the break, you know? And uh, so I said to Chrissy, look, you wanna, we want to find out what's going on. What happened was we found out eventually that a neighbor of his had died around the corner. But the way Christy would, the, the way he would take things and the way he would explain them, he said like, uh, Darren, you won't believe what happened. One of Catherine's friends knocked at the door, obviously to come round to, you know, console her, Christy. And I answered the door, she nearly dropped dead in front of me. Like, you know, <laughs> I thought you were dead, you know? So the... Um, so little mishaps like that, you know, well, yeah. mishaps for one person, but tragically for somebody else, you know, yeah. unfortunately. I'm sure we'll get the good stories off here. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Knocked off. So come here, how long were you with the boys for? Gee, I was trying to think of that on the way in. I know I started with um, Here Comes Lucy Jones was just being finished at the time. The lads were just kind of... Uh, what year would that have been then? I'm just trying the to think 90s, of... Early 90s, is it? It's, yeah, I'd say the early 90s because... Like 1988, they got back together. Or 1988, they split. 94, they got back. And Goodbye Charlie Moonhead was out. And uh, so, the Here Comes Lucy Jones, I'd say around the 90s, yeah, when that came out. And that was just in the demo stages. So I, kind of, I went in very kind of like immature to music, but kind of knew the way I'd like things to look. Or if I was going to see Aslan, or if I was going to see you, I'd like the things to look a certain way. And um, the lads kind of had that thing as well, you know, that things should be a certain way. So the um, we went in on that. I went on that album. And then what happened was, was then just the tour then happened. You know, the Olympias and all that type of stuff, you know. And um, But they were just great times. Mm. You know, absolutely great. And for a band that had been around such a long time with such history to effectively take it under their wing. And like they're teaching you you know and then eventually they start relying on you based on what they've taught you just a great privilege you know mm. and when all that packed in what did you move on to next then oh god um <coughs> when all that packed in i was then did stuff with the four of us they're from Newry. they had a big hit out years ago mary and uh, they were great lads to work with they used to like rehearse rehearsals you know great songwriters and really, really into their music. And then I moved then on to Mickey Hart then, mm. doing stuff with Mickey Hart after he came back from Eurovision. And back and forth to the four of us and then some stuff with George Murphy, you know? So you stayed in managing music? Um, well, I stayed in doing the production part, you know? Yeah. Now with George Murphy, Dave Brown was his manager. Not Dave Brown from Picture House, the other Dave Brown. And I'm not going to say like I co-managed George, but myself and Dave would bang our heads together and try come up with ideas uh, for George, you know? And I was driving a taxi at the time because, you know, there wasn't that much work around i always kept the job and the um so the uh the mickey harting was very interesting to see we did crow park uh for the um special olympics at that time just to see the reception mm. that mickey hart would have on the big stage you know and then going to work with somebody like george morphy you know kind of on that kind of folk end of things you know so the um i've seen um i've been around kind of different you know, genres of music that mm. word um but they all had their own story to tell. But they're all unique as well. You know, because George did stuff with the Dubliners. Now he's going like Ronnie Drew. And then uh, like Mickey Hart was doing things with, like he supported um, Tommy Kitten down in Cork. And I was going like, Tommy Kitten. And then like Aslam were doing, you know, obviously they were headlining all their own gigs. So it was a great mixture, a great mm. kind of mix of a bag to be thrown into. Mm. Um, so... You pack all the music stuff up, that was that just kind of fizzled out itself? No, it just kind of fizzled out. Like the Aslan thing ended like on just a phone call, you know? Yeah. They have these things of ended. Thing. I mean, Christy got a phone call when it finished for him. I got a phone call when it finished for me, like, you know? And when that happened, like, you're devastated. You know, yeah. they literally just take the big chunk out of your life, you know? Um, but when the music started fizzling out, I did a thing with George Murphy and we had, um, it was launched up in Donahue's, not too far from here. And the, uh, I was going to get out with Fiona at the time. And what happened was, and I was driving me a taxi, I was driving the taxi, and I was looking after George at the same time. So I had met my future wife driving a taxi. I was coming down, I think it was uh, um, from Condra, and I seen three people put out their hand for a taxi, and she get in, our two mates get in the back. And she started asking me about guitars and stuff like that. And I was thinking, maybe she was at an Aslan gig. Why should she be asking me about guitars? And they said, look, there's my number. I said, give me a ring and we'll... Um, 
some chance I'll get you to what I'm going to say you know Close me out, never gets fed do what? Right, yeah. so the, uh, she rang me the next day for guitar lessons and then we ended up becoming friends you know and uh, what happened was when the guitar George guitar lessons do what <laughs> well, see, the in the back then was it well see there's only certain strings you can pull you, <laughs> know? <laughs> you know and I was well in tune so the um, <laughs> so the uh, so what happened was we just became friends and then she kind of knew what I she knew what I did you know kind of part time and she could see it going, I'm not going to say going wrong, but she could see it going nowhere, you know, because you'd be working on this project and then you'd be on to the next one. Mm. There's no real money in it, especially if you're holding down another job. So she just recommended, the night Michael Jackson died, she said to me, um, on Stephen's Green, would you not do Laura Medicine? And I was like, what? I said, Laura Medicine? And she goes, yeah. Now I did weights for years. And I was thinking, maybe she wants you to be a physio. And, but law, she has no winter cert, no leaving cert, mm. nothing. And what does she do? She's she works at James's. She's a nurse. She's assistant director of nursing. So she's kind of like the old matrons. Remember the old matrons used to go around keeping the nurses in line? But Fiona's not like a white glover. Like if you went in tonight with a cardiac arrest, she'd work on you, you know? She'd be in charge. She'd be visiting like over 50 wards. Yeah. Um, so she just kind of noticed this thing, as I said before to other people, that I didn't know I had. You know, like an ability to do mm. something different. So the um, tonight Michael Jackson died, we set up, we were watching telly. And the, uh, we were watching all the scenes from where he lived. And I said, OK, I'll go into Dublin Business School and see. We did a bit of research on it. And the law part just kind of happened from there. And you were just doing like law with like no real end goal. You just like, I'll do this and see what happens. Or did That's you wanna... exactly it. Yeah. That, uh, it was kind of like, I'll do this and see what happens or see what, um, see where I can kind of get out, but see where it's going to lead, you know. I was kind of lost at that time. Yeah. You know, I didn't know what to be doing or where to be turning. And, How old are uh, you at this stage? Oh, geez. Well, um, it was 2008, so it's what's, I'm 50 oh, this year, so I was in my mid-30s, yeah. you know. Mm. I just didn't know what to be doing. And the, um, so we decided to go in, like, do the law degree, went into DBS, and uh, John O'Keefe and Barry Halton were the, the guys who went in. I think John O'Keefe was the dean at the time, and Barry Halton was a barrister. I didn't know him. We went in for the open day. And, you know, people were guards and he worked in the Department of Justice and then other people did this and I'm driving a taxi and I said, look, lads, I know nothing about law. And they said, do you have any kids around like that? I said, no. And he says, okay. They said, look, put your mind into this for the first year. Once you get through that, you'll be grand. We'll mind you, you know. So just kind of started from there. And the law degree took three years. Drove me taxi um, during the day or sometimes at night time. We used to mix and match it. And um, I'd get all my notes read them into my phone and played them in the Bluetooth going around the, the city. That's the only way I could learn. Yeah. You know? Because I wasn't a great reader. I could read, but it would have to really interest me to read things. Yeah. And the um and that's how it started. Yeah. It was as simple as that, you know? And we the own uh, the own jobs around at the course trying to pick up a few solicitors and barristers was, down there. Yeah, the um I used to pull in at the um the globe at night time in, in uh, I think it was Georgia Street. And I'd be recording the stuff in. And then we had to, I had to move some of the, the work to days then. And the, uh, I used to pull up outside James's hospital and then the CCJ. And then people used to get into the car, like, you know. Mm. And this guy got in one day, Luigi Ray, and he goes, hey, you seen it? There's this law book sitting there. And he goes, hey, are you in trouble, son? Like, I said, I'm doing this law degree and I, you know, I'm stuck on evidence, wherever it was. And he said, oh, you, you need to look here. You need to look there, you know. And, um, so I kept on going back to the court. So I told Barry Holt, you know, I had this guy in the car today, Luigi Ray. Oh, Luigi Ray, he said, tell him I was asking for him. He's practicing like, like 40 years. And I didn't know who Luigi Ray was. And the, um, so I just kept on going to the courts. And Luigi said to me a year later, he said, look, if you want to be a barrister and if you come down, you know, I'll take you on. He says that the, um, you can be me devil. I didn't know where the devil was. He said, what's the devil, you know? And it's like an apprenticeship that you kind of do in your first mm. year. And it just kind of happened from there. So every day I'd pull up, see who'd be getting into the car, and then um, try to rob tips off them. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Voice off. Yeah, yeah no, try to rob right. tips off them. It's, yeah. it's, it's a clever way of going about it, you know? Like, you'll have all this information in the book, but you can get real-life examples from people who are in the, in the know-how in that field. Then why not? Oh, be, look, it's incredible. This gentleman got in one time, uh, this lady got in one time, and she said to me, oh, if you're looking for this, um, this book on something, she says, or... We look for a, a particular area of law. She says that this barrister, she says, wrote a great article on that. So she told me where to get it. And I had an A4 pad and she wrote his name down, Tony McGillicuddy, you know. And she says, look for his article online. She says, you'll find it. I think it will help you. So I said, grand. Dropped the lady down to the four courts. Went back to the CCJ. 
And four or five people, wherever it was, came back, came into the car then. And uh, I threw all their stuff in the boot. And on the front seat was the A4 piece of paper. So this gentleman got in, he picks it up and he goes, um, he says, what's my name? <laughs> you know, no way. A4 pad. And I said, no way, I'll tell you what happened, you know. So all these coincidences just kind of happened at the same time. And the, um, I just stuck with it, you know. It was tough. Yeah. But I stuck with it. You Did know? you ever imagine when you were younger, you had to go into that? Not area? a hope. No, you wind me up, not a hope. Did you ever have any run-ins with law and you were like, you know? No, are you like I used to look at the difference between right and wrong, you know? And how can he can be guilty of that, but he's not guilty of this? Or how can the police do this or do it? I was always kind of interested in how things worked. But um, I didn't have any run-ins with the law. Like everybody else, I mean, you know, you get your scrapes grown up. I, I kind of kept myself, I'm not going to say clean, but, you know, away from trouble. I was always busy doing you things. still travel, sort of. Yeah, yeah, you know, but that doesn't mean that, you know, there's other people out there who kind of, you're going to sing now, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's other people out there who kind of... Um, it's not their fault, you know, kind of like who they are. Yeah. Because they maybe they came from a different background. And it's very important that people recognize that I've been very lucky. I mean, Aslan took me under their wing, you know, to to do what I've done, you know, for a lot of my life. And Luigi Ray took me under his wing. But all this thing with law wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Fiona. You yeah. know, she kind of just noticed something there that we can kind of build upon and, and try to get a, a proper education. Yeah, it does seem very weird that you'd pick like law for a career if there's no kind of background there to it, like to, to steer you down that way. And especially you said, you said your wife is in medical as well. Yeah. But just law seems very weird. Like, mm. And I think this is a big thing. Like, There's so many people from our area who will have run-ins with law, mm -hmm. but don't choose law as a career or their siblings don't choose law as a career. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because you wouldn't be short a few clients. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a bang but see, I didn't pick law. It yeah, picked for me. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and the uh, but it was just it's kind of like somebody saying to you, Look, I think you should do a podcast, and you're probably sitting there going, oh, Why do we want to do that for? But it's just an idea, and I just, I just, excuse me, I just went with it. Mm. Like, why not? Because everything, everything else I did in life, you could say was a gamble, but life is not a gamble. I'm not here for that. I'm here to do something, and sometimes you don't recognize yourself what you can do or what you can't do. I mean, when I started with Aslan. To, to work with Aslan up to get to the Point Depot or to do the, the Made in Dublin, the Five Nights in Vicar Street and to be in charge of that production, like the, the, the live part. Now, obviously, Larry Bass was the guy who did the Made in Dublin part. Um, but to be part of the, uh, the live production and to, to run it and to advise on it, all that came about only because other people seen in me that maybe he can become a little bit better at what we think he can do. Mm. You know, so it's just when other people see it and they kind of, it's like pimp my ride. They kind of take you, they fix you up and you become their product, you know. Mm. So the law thing is not a hope. Me growing up doing law. Yeah. Very profitable career though, isn't it? When you think. But no. Like... Well, let me tell you, the answer is no, because when you were saying earlier on, um, I'll give you, I'll give you an example now. I'll give you a question. What would you say I get paid for going into the district court. Now, my, my practice is mainly in the district court because I'm young in years at the bar. You know, I'm there mm. since 2015. I was some work in the circuit court, but mainly district court. So what would you say on your first day in court, not your, if you were in court for the first day, I get paid. <laughs> so let's think now, the first day in court is like, you get, we might apply for legal aid. I might advise you on, I might advise you on the charges that you have. We might do a bail application. You may plead guilty on the first day, but for the first day in court, what would you say I get? I don't want to be smart or anything, but I, I've never actually had to pay a solicitor. <laughs> yeah. No, but no. But, yeah. Well, actually, well, actually, well, even that. Neither have I, free legal on, aid. Under the, well, in, under the free legal aid scheme, what would you say I get paid? 350. I think, I think, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Oh, okay. So you Just say higher or lower than 350? 500. 500. For the first day in court, yeah. under the criminal legal aid scheme, your tickets are 20 euro. Plus the booking fee for your show that's coming up. Yeah. Isn't that right? Okay. And I get my haircut for 20 euro around the corner from where I live. 16 euro, throw the girl, a four euro tip. I get it's paid. Love. I get paid under the criminal legal aid scheme 25 euro and 20 cent to represent somebody in court on the first day. If you plead guilty and we do the plea mitigation, you know, telling the court why you did it and, you, you know, I would get um, 50 euro and 40 cent. If it goes to hearing, we get 67 euro under the criminal legal aid scheme.
So people think that... So you just don't want <coughs> the boys to get a strike out in the first day then? No, it. see, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work like that because when somebody comes in, like they're literally, I'm not going to say placing their life in your hands, but something has gone wrong mm. in their life, you mm. know? And they're saying, look, you know, I did it or I didn't do it or whatever the situation is. And when we, people think that when you become a barrister, there's like a, um, you know, there's gold at the end of the rainbow. There's not. See, this is something I'm glad you touched on it there, yeah. people putting that, your life, their life in your hands because like mm. through more experiences in court, like personally and when I went with friends and I've yeah. seen like people being represented, I couldn't get my head around it because yeah. like I'm one of these people that if I fail, I fail because of me. If I succeed, I like to succeed because of what I do. Yeah. Um, when you see someone standing up in court and they have someone else speaking for them and it's literally like they're whispering in their ear and the solicitor, the barrister are speaking. I'm like, you could have actually just spoke those words. You know what I mean? You don't mm -hmm. have to say them to the middleman. But you and that, can. Oh, that, yeah, you could. But I mean, that always baffled me. So I always thought to myself, like, why are these people not just representing themselves? And not to be insulting mm -hmm. to you or your profession, but I just thought these people are they're very timid when they're speaking. Yeah. They're judges. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, my client heard the, on the day in question that this, when you're like, have a bit more conviction in your voice. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Stand up. Put mm -hmm. your chest out, speak, mm -hmm. sound convincing. Mm -hmm. And then you see, like, it'd be put back or whatever. And you're like, to me, it just never sat right with me, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it's just the whole, the whole experience with law and the courts, I think it needs to be cleared up, especially for, for people in our area. And Jim, when Jim Sheridan was on, he, he said it. He's like, you're not very coerced in law growing up. No one actually tells you anything yeah. until you're in the thick of it and you have to learn quick then. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's something that needs to be broadcast a lot more. You know, there's resources available to you. You know what I mean? Like, there's knowledge out there. Go and apply yourself with, with things like law. Like, simple as that. Like, I looked up what Section 8 meant mm -hmm. when the Public Order Act, so it can't be abused towards you. And I think there's a perception where uh, court that when you go in, it's you against the police and the judge. When that's not the case, mm -hmm. it's you and the police convincing the judge who was right and who was wrong and what happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perception that people need to I change. Think you stand a lesser chance though if you go in without a barrister, I think for, because not everybody can apply themselves. No, but. So there's young flesh who are going to go in and they're going to wear the track suits and they're going to talk about the talk and they're going to be like, no, hold on for a minute, like, and, mm. and it just doesn't look well for you. So it's easier to get somebody in who can actually. But I, what I meant was. a lot of young flesh get frustrated yeah. well and fumble and they're like, no, he fucking, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I think it's easier. And, and even if I'm involved in situations like, you know, even if, you know, like if we had, like my mum was sick through COVID and we had one or two difficulties with her care, you know? And yeah, and when you go in to, to, you know, to tell the hospital or the nursing home or the doctor what has happened, you, you're kind of wrapped up, you're kind of a little bit too much wrapped up in it, you know? So it's important, I think, to get anybody maybe just to, just to kind of maybe step back and let's look at the whole situation mm. and see where it is. Um, for me going into court, is that like, see, not everybody has, like when you're looking up section eight, maybe you can pass that, bit of wisdom onto somebody else. When I have like Aslan and they train me to become something, they're passing on their wisdom to me. When Fiona, you know, seeing something in me, she's passing it on to me. Or when Luigi Ray is passing information on to me, it, it's kind of passing things down the line all the time. So everybody can benefit because like all the tomorrows are there for everybody and not just for the people who claim today for themselves, you know? The, the, when you go down and become a barrister, like there's, there's people in there who are geniuses, you know, they're very well educated and they're great people to work around. But the fact is, is that when you go into, if Fiona wasn't working, I would say I'd be gone from the bar a long time ago because you can't survive in 2520, mm. you know? So I need her support again to help me keep my practice going. So effectively, she's like subsidized my practice, if I can put it that way. Um, but when you go into court and when somebody is pleading guilty or when they're accused of a crime, I have a job to do. The same way when you go into hospital, a surgeon has a job to do. Um, I mean, I'm sure that Fiona and her colleagues are going to give somebody bad news tonight, God forbid, and you may have to give a client bad news. So you're just representing them to the best of their ability. And if they plead guilty and say, look, I'm wrong, it's important to give the court um, a kind of a view of what has happened, you know, how it came about, what the background to the situation is, because every story has a start, middle and end, you know. And when you go to court, you're hearing the end part of it. This is what he did or this is what she did, you know. So the um, when you're standing up in court, people do get frustrated. I get nervous going into court. If you don't get nervous, what's the point in doing it? Exactly. Yeah. You don't be going and kind of, you know, 
you know, cocky, like if I can put it that way. And the um, and judges are fair people. They mm. listen to what you have to say, you know, and they will apply the law as as they see best, mm. you know. Mm. And you have to, of course, judges get it wrong. I get it wrong. I'm sure doctors get it wrong. And the, um, but yeah, some people do represent themselves mm. and some I, people would rely on other yeah. people to help. Them. I'm not saying I, I encourage people to no, disregard right. but I mean, like there's a perception that it's you against the judge mm. and the guard when that's not the case. The judge is there to take in all the information and make a decision. Yeah. You're there to plead your case. The guard sounds is sounds more difficult. Um, like if you just think about, oh, I'm up in court, you automatically mm. think, I need yourself. help. Yeah. Yeah. Help. But, yeah. What I meant as well is it's not you against the two of them. Mm-hmm. It's just you against the one. It's mm-hmm. you against the person who has you in court. Yeah. And the two is are pleading with the judge. Yeah. You know, yeah, like that. Yeah. Like the, I had one run in in uh, court in my life and it was struck out. Mm-hmm. And it was struck out because the judge looked at the situation and says, like, this is ridiculous. And in front of the guard. Now, I, I personally thought it was very embarrassing on the guard's behalf for even having this up there. And then the judge obviously thought that as well and struck her out. And, and you represent yourself? Yeah, I just stood up and the judge, yeah, no problem, struck out, good luck. Mm-hmm. And that was it. And the guard sat down with his head down. And but when they was, get, do, they, do coppers get paid extra? For going to court. I think they do. Court. Well, well, the guard would be on, well, well, the guard would be on a salary. I mean, because they're guards, you know. So I would say that um, when they're going to court during their work day, that's part of their work. And I'd say that if they're going to court on days that they don't work, or maybe they get time in lieu, you know. I can tell you to get more than 25 euro, 20 cents. <laughs> so if you're standing outside the courtroom, yeah, mm-hmm. the names will be on the wall, yeah. with the show name after the Lord. Yeah. Them. And if you look on like certain months, you, most of the time it'll be one copper has about 10 or 15 yeah, people. Yeah, the mm-hmm. day I was in court, on, on one copper had like 13 people up. Mm-hmm. All there, could be, there could be any reason behind that. There could be... There could be any reason, you know, so you wouldn't know. I mean, I get a call today, oh, will you go into court tomorrow and do A, B and C, you know, and you're given the papers, you meet the client, you find out what the situation mm. is. But it's kind of like, it, it's kind of like going at the hospital and say, well, why didn't they give him that treatment or why did they give him this or why didn't they give him that? You know, it, for me, every situation is very, every shop is easy to look into from the outside. But when you go in, you start to kind of realise what it's all about. Mm. And everybody's situation is different. Every allegation is different. You know, every guilty plea is different, you know. And so it's easy to read the newspapers and say, oh, look at this and look at that, you know, unless you're really, yeah. unless you're really in the case, unless you really know about it. So it's very hard to comment on something that you're not part of. Yeah. Uh, unless you're part of it. And if you are part of it, you can't really comment on it because mm. it's between you and the client yeah. and the court, you know. Well, I think there's, I think this is something, it's like a mystery, like, the law and courts and stuff like that to people until you're in the thick of it. You know, like that, and then people learn about it as they're going. And I think that's the wrong way of going about it because mm-hmm. you're learning on the job, but like, it's a delicate thing, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because it, it literally could be a livelihood yeah. is in, it's in, even on like, the line there. If you were diagnosed, God forbid, like if I was diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, I'd be off reading up about the cancer I have and mm. what not to eat and what medication and should I go running or should I do this, you know? So I think that when something knocks on your door, it's only at that time you'll actually sit back and yeah, it's a good and, way of looking and, and at, look yeah. at what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only way I could explain it. Like for me to go into the courts and stand and represent somebody, um, like I'm 50 this year, I went back to school very, very late. And for me, it's just like, this is incredible to actually stand and represent other people. For me to walk onto stage and tune a guitar for Joey Joel or for Billy McGuinness or Mickey Hart or for Blue, we did a couple of things with Blue or to walk on the same stage as Madness. You know, these things are incredible to do. Um, but it's only when you're, when you look at a, a show, like you're going to have a lo- live show coming up mm. and you'll actually see from your live show the amount of work that goes into that. Mm. So behind the scenes will always be behind the scenes unless you look behind the scenes, mm. I think. Yeah. So uh, you eventually got, you went back, you said you failed yeah. your exams. You eventually you passed them. I eventually passed the Kings in exams, yeah. Yeah. And Horrendous. <laughs> so what 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 way is a walk then? So you pass that, you get into the you get into Kings in yep. College, is it? So, excuse me, I did the uh, law degree in DBS, yeah, Dublin Business School. That was three years, yeah. And then you have to do your entrance exam to get into the Kings Inns. And that's to become a barrister, yeah. It? So when you get into the Kings, so you get your law degree in Dublin Business School, and when you're going into the Kings Inns, you do your barrister law degree. So those exams are over five days, Monday to Friday. Yeah, three hour exams. If you fail one. You have to come back next year and repeat them all. You can't move on to the next you one. You can't move yeah. on. So what happened? No, you, you have to sit the whole five of them. And yeah. then after you sit the whole five of them, 
Uh, even if you knew you failed exam number three, you still have to sit the other two. And a year later, you have to go back and sit them all again. Oh, no way. So even if you say you passed one to four and yeah. you failed five, you can't just sit five. No, you, you have, have to go sit. back. Oh, you have to go oh, back next that, year. Yeah. So we had failed those kind of first five exams. And the, uh, so what city colleges were very good to me. They prepared me for the Kings and entrance exams. Uh, Philip Bork said, look, we have this program in place. They help people you know, get into the law society to become a solicitor. And we have one to help people get into the King's Inns to become a barrister. We get all the information you've learned over the past three years and we compile it in such a way that you're able to answer questions, you know. So you have all this knowledge, you don't know how to apply. So Philip Bork put this thing together and uh, myself and Fergal McSharry went in and we did the exams yeah. and we failed. I think I failed one I failed one exam and I think it was a few points short on another one. And Fer Fergal had failed a few. So the, uh, the year later, then we went back to City Colleges again. They prepared us again and we got in the second time round. So we spent two years in the King's Inns. And in 2000, excuse me, 2015, we were called to the Bar of Ireland, you know. Mad, absolutely. So what does nuts. that mean? You call to the bar. That means you're a, a you're, barrister. You're, yeah, you're kind of sworn in as a barrister. So yeah. the graduation is in the King's Inns, and then you go to the Chief Justice. You know, I'm not saying you go to the Chief Justice, but you go down to the Supreme Court, and they swear you in. So upstairs, you know, you have your gown on for the first time, and you have your three-piece suit, like you know, and you're going great. You have a three-piece suit on, and um, I'm real small, like so. They got all the communion suits. So like, <laughs> yeah. They'll fit me, like you know, and the um, I used to be a guy down there called Peter, and he'd put the the wig on your head and make sure it's straight and all. And you'd face around to the mirror and she can see herself. You're like, oh. And um, then you get down, you kind of, you take her out before the court. You know, they, they yeah. it's like being sworn in. Yeah. Like, put it that way. So you're called to the bar. Give or take, it could take it five years to, from when you, it could take it five years. Yeah. So three years so, doing the law degree and then two years. Yeah. So three years, then a year in between because we failed and then two years. So it took six years altogether. Yeah. But like in. if someone say, I don't know, tomorrow, let's say Terence decided to go into law. Yeah. In five years time, he could be a practicing barrister. You can get in four years because you do your law degree in three and then the King's Inns, you can do a one year. You can do a full-time barrister law degree. I did a part-time. Mm. All right. Because I had to work and we had two kids. I need yeah. to be able to pay for it. Yeah. And um, so we get in. So it took, what, three, one. So six years it took. Yeah. Six years of hell. It's madness, that. It's like, yeah. it's never too late to actually go and, yeah. like, you and you're living proof. Oh, come here. Like, to me, if you would have said to someone, like, oh, he's a barrister, I'd say, right, he left school and he went straight yeah. into college and he and he got stuck but in the that, books. Like Everybody thinks that, you know, like, people, like, when you, people ask me a question, like, I don't know everything, I can't, yeah. I don't think there is a barrister who knows everything. Unless they're, you know, all up, well, here's the charge. If they're not sure, they'll go off and they'll read up and they'll research the law. But you're, you're dealing in different things every day, you know. And for me, like, f for me to go back to school and to get, you know, my law degree, my barrister law degree, like, for me, that was just incredible because, you know, I've not went to cert, I've nothing, not mm. even cert. And I left school very, very early. I left school really, really early. And my uncle Brandon used to be on my case all the time. Oh, I should go back to school, he said, and you know, do this and do that. And it got to the stage that he was wrecking my head. And then my mum and dad, they were kind of on my case a little bit, but you know, let him find his way and we see what happens. Um, I used to walk with my dad on the tours they used to get paid in CIE in Fisbury. And we used to walk through the King's Inns. And I'd be holding his hand. And I'd be saying, oh, what are they doing here, dad? That's where you're trying to become a judge. He used to say, oh, very good. And little did I know, you know, whatever, Some 20 years, or 30 years come later, full circle, yeah. I'd be in there, but if I can do it, anybody can do it. Mm. But what happens is that people need the support to get in and do something. Whether it's you with your podcast, whether it's Christy Raslan, whether it's Mickey Hart, whether it's Shane McGowan, everybody needs that support, you know? I definitely think there's barriers in the way for a lot of people, especially from our areas. Mm. As you said earlier on, you were sort of like lucky enough to get the break. It's very, very lucky. Life. And there's definitely barriers. There. Like, as I said, when you go into the courts now, um, there's people who may be there who may be on pensions, let's say, they're in different jobs. So they're able to kind of sustain, let's say, those losses, right? Yeah. Or you may have somebody who, um, who may have a lot of money behind them or maybe their wife or their, their parents or, you know, have a few bobs. So they're not really, I'm not saying they're not really worried about money, but they kind of have that backdrop. But to get to that level, you still have to go to college first, yeah. you know? And I think for me that there are definitely obstacles placed in front of me. And I think the obstacles really came from me, you know? Mm. So what we do in the courts is that, or what I do, they have a look into law program and they will accept students in from any area. They don't care where you come from. And it's like a lottery you know, and p kids will apply and they'll spend a week in the courts. So they'll spend a week with me. There'll be about 10 or 12 kids and we show them um, 
you know, how the courts work. Yeah. We go down to the four courts, we bring them to a Green Street court. And, but I just go that a little bit further. I take transition year students in and they spend a week with me. Like and work experience. They come in on, yep, they come in on day one and they get to see the cells. And it's from day one, we create a scenario. Let's say somebody gets assaulted at McDonald's or they were drink driving or they had no insurance on the car, they didn't realize it. And we create a scenario and we let them see how it goes through the courts, you know. So I'm giving them the opportunity that I never had. I'm not yeah. sure the opportunity was there, you know, long before I went into the courts. But I give them an opportunity. But I have people who've got in contact with me to say, because of that week, or because of that talk, he gave me the encouragement to go and look for a loan or to go and try to get a grant. There's one girl I know um, who's actually studying now, during a law degree, and she wants to go into the King's Inn. That's class. And it's great because you're basically saying, I've helped one person to become something that they're always able to become. But they never but they thought just they never, could be, yeah. They just never realised. Yeah. You know? And that's the thing. So... You were saying obstacles. I'd love more people in an area to get involved in law, but on the other side of the law, you know what I mean? Because yeah. they're always on the wrong side. And as I said, yeah. you always come well versed in the law when you're on the wrong side of it. You need to find out. Mm -hmm. I'd love to go up to court and hear a lot more solicitors and barristers that sound like us, you know, yeah. and be like, that's class because it's not it's not a classist thing. It's a upper class person representing a working class person mm -hmm. all the time. I'd love to see that the diversity in there. And that program sounds deadly, getting kids oh, It's great. And because of, involved, COVID, so because of COVID, it had to be knocked on the head. Yeah. I have a student coming in, well, subject to the restrictions. We received an email uh, from the Bar Council um, today, which I haven't read yet. But the, um, and this thing I do, I do it myself. But the, um, it's great to receive guidance to see what courts are open and what courts are closed and how things are moving. But when you have a student coming in who's rattling, Mm. I mean, rattling, they're coming into court. It's great for them to see something different. And even if they go to James's and they spend a week, let's say, working alongside a nurse, you know, it's great just to give anybody that opportunity, you know. But definitely, there's definitely barriers um, for people to go back to education. Mm. No shadow of a doubt. Is it, when you go back as a mature student, the point system goes out the window, doesn't it? Um, yeah, the point system for me, <sighs> it is. I paid for going course, back to DBS. Yeah. So when I've been to DBS, I think the fees worked out 15,000 for that for the three years. And the King's Inns worked out 12,000, I think 12,500. And what I used to do was, I used to drive the taxi. And Fiona said, look, wherever I get paid, wherever she gets paid, I look after the family. And she said, wherever you get paid, you just pay for college. But she yeah. ended up throwing money in against it as well. And then I was driving a taxi at the time and I remember going out one day and earning 50 euro. I said, Fiona, I can't drive the taxi anymore for 50 euro. So she said, look, train as a healthcare assistant and come into St. James's Hospital. So I trained as a healthcare assistant, went into St. James's Hospital and worked there while I was in the King's Inns, mm. you know. So the um, so I was kind of lucky that way that we had Fiona's income because it was just me on my own trying to support, let's say, two kids. Because yeah. we had we didn't have children when I we went to college. Yeah. You know, the kids came like in my second year. Actually, my first year exams was criminal law. And uh, Fiona went into labour on that day. The, exactly one year later on the same day, my exam was company law and Fiona went into labour that day, you know? <laughs> and absolute disaster. And in year three, they were saying, all right, is there anybody pregnant now? Yeah. <laughs> but the, um, so I was very lucky that way. And I was extremely, extremely lucky to have that. But the, um, it's the people I worry about is somebody who doesn't have that behind them who doesn't have the financial backing behind them. And there are some grants there. Yeah. I think there should be more grants. Yeah. Because everybody deserves a chance to be what they are. Every mm. single person, you know. And if something stops them, they're going to have to try to get over that hurdle. And it's my job and your job and everybody else's job to help them. And I think if you're out of education for more than two years and you're over the age of 23 or 24, or you qualify as a mature student, and that's when the point system goes out the window. Yeah, the point system went out the window for me. I just we just paid, and I said yeah. paid away like bribe people, but we just paid. Oh yeah, and, and did and did did uh, mm. you know did the the two degrees, but the um, but anybody can change their direction yeah. if they're just if they're just pointed in the right direction because a very simple mistake that you make in life can bring about a lifetime of guilt. And maybe not a lifetime of guilt in the courts where you're guilty of a criminal offence, but, you know, things happen. Trauma happens in people's <clears throat> lives. And what happens is that that lifetime of guilt is kind of, oh, I shouldn't have done that, or I should have done this, you know? And these simple mistakes hang on to you forever. So 
I'm just happy that people literally just got me at the right time and said, this is what we think you should do. Mm. You know, I've been extremely lucky to have the life I'm at the heaven. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like working with my idols, Aslan, mm. you know, working with the four of us, you know, Jesus is great. Working with Mickey Hart, you know, working with George Murphy, you know, like uh, designing George's album cover, uh, doing some of the photographs. I mean, these are, and still holding down the day job. So I was very lucky and very privileged. Um, but for somebody to come along and say to you, look, I think maybe you should do something different now. It's, it's, a, it's just great for someone just to catch you and just pick you up and not change where you are, just face you, Go yeah, into you. in a different location. And you're living proof of that. I'd love somebody who's listening to this who maybe is a bit lost and doesn't know, like, it's not too late, you know what I mean? You can apply yourself. And I know you said there's not many, but there is some resources out there like yeah. grants and access mm -hmm. programs and stuff like that so mm -hmm. if people are thinking about it, to go back to education especially yeah. becoming a barrister i remember at that time when i did have that running in court i was in sixth year mm -hmm. school and i remember thinking like this is deadly i'd love to get involved in this mm -hmm. but the points for law at the time i was like it's not a chance i'm getting it like you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and i always said look i'd love to go down that route because i don't know you may not have noticed this but i love arguing with people <laughs> and uh, i was like do you know what i'd, I'd like to get in there because mm -hmm. i'd like to because i'm like yourself i'd like I like the process of things and mm -hmm. understanding the process mm -hmm. and then being able to apply that and be like, well, this is what happened mm -hmm. and this is what was broken. This is mm -hmm. what wasn't broken, mm -hmm. etc." Yeah. So like, imagine somebody listening to this now and be like, you know what? I, I'm 25. I don't know what I'm going to be doing with me. Yeah. Like, Even it's... just one person. I put up a thing on LinkedIn. I was looking at it today. It was 11 months ago. Just a kind of brief, maybe eight or nine liner of how I, I think when the, when the pandemic came, people were panicking over their leaving cert. And I just put something up just to say, oh, look, this is what I did. And I got, looking at it today, I think I got 301,000 views on LinkedIn. And I was getting messages off people who had exams on Monday and they were sending me messages on Sunday saying, I read your article, the Kingsons did a, a brief article and I was doing exams tomorrow. I didn't want to go in to do them, but kind of your, art, your thing is kind of at the egging me on to go mm. in and do it. And like, if that's just one person, Brilliant. You know, if you can just change the whole thing just for one person, it's uh, it's incredible. But I think government, they just need to, they just need to wake up, you know, and let's change this all elite society. Let's yeah. create opportunities for every single person. I am practicing at the bar. I'm in court in the morning. I mean, I may not be a, a practicing barrister come September, you know, because I won't be able to survive in fees of 25 euro, 20 cents, you know, and something has to be done. I mean, if, if if student nurses were paid 25 euro and 20 cent, you know, for representing somebody or looking after somebody, there'd, there'd be war, you know? Mm -hmm. So people have to to wake up and say that if you're doing an important job, regardless what it is, that you have to be paid and you have to be paid properly. Mm -hmm. So the way it is with me and some of my colleagues, I mean, in March, um, in March, uh, there's going to be a situation now where barristers at my level uh, you know, may have to walk out of the courts, you know, may have to walk on the steps of the courts and send a message to government to say, you know, like 25 euro, 20 cent is, no, it is it's, it's not, it, it's an insult. Yeah. So, but I say to people, go back to college if you can, or go back to school, study anything you want. If you're studying law, go off and be a barrister, become a solicitor, keep away from crime. I mean, the criminal end of uh, practicing until the legal aid system is fixed and fixed properly you know, and maybe go in-house working somewhere or keep at civil law. But don't let anything stop you from becoming something that you've always could have been, you know. And it's up for everybody, I think, to pass on that message. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to everybody. Yeah. So, Darden, you're sworn into the bar, yeah? Yeah. What's your first day in court like? <sighs> first day in court was on... I was dropped outside on a Monday, and my wife dropped me outside. And she gave me a fiver for me lunch. With a fiver, I had me gown in a bag. And I was going, oh, Jesus, you know, like, like lunch money. And I remember waiting for Luigi Ray to arrive because he was my master for the year. It's kind of like an apprenticeship you do. And yeah, to make sure that you don't bankrupt the state or anything or make a show <laughs> of yourself. And my mate rings me and he goes, come on. He says, down to the uh, to the, the early house. He says, <laughs> we get down to, he was working in James. I said, I've only a fiver. Come on, leave that till tomorrow. I said, I have to go in, I have to go in. So I went in on my first day, which was on Monday. And Luigi, we did my first day, you know, getting the feel of the place. And he said to me, um, Monday night, he says, your first day making an application in court will be tomorrow, will be Tuesday. And I was going, oh, geez. So he told me what I had to do. And obviously I went in the next day and I was kind of, 
you don't know how loud you have to speak or how loud. I just remember like making the application. I could see like the kind of the, the breeze passing everybody's hair. It's probably shouting like, you know, but it was um, very nerve wracking, you know. But yeah, I did it and it was a challenge. Mm. And the, um, but very nerve wracking because you were trying to, you knew Luigi had you well briefed what you had to ask, mm. why you were asking it, any difficulties that could happen with the application or anything that the court may ask you. But he was, um, he had your back all the time. He'd be sitting in the front row and you'd be kind of three or four rows back. So he'd be there in case anything went wrong, but nerve wracking. Yeah. I was just sitting there like saying, what am I doing? The same when I was doing the Aslan things, you'd be going to walk on stage in the pints, doing production manager, and you'd be saying, Jesus, what am I doing here? Like, you know, and it's the same, mm. you know. Uh, are you allowed to go into any detail about what happened on that day? Like your client? No, or, I no? can't. No, it no. wasn't my client. It was his one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're right. NDAs, yeah. isn't it? Well, Non-disclosure yeah. agreement. It was his, his client, you know. But yeah. the, um, no, it, it's, um, it's nerve-wracking, but you, you kind of learn as you're going along. You learn, um, you know, how to, you know, how to look at a case, how to read it, how to advise the client. But you don't know everything. And the support amongst your colleagues up there is incredible. Mm -hmm. To actually turn, you know, to a colleague who's sitting beside you and say, look, like, what's this all about? And they stop what they're doing, they tell you, mm. you know? The support's incredible. It really, really is incredible. Um, but the downside of the bar is just people think that you have this kind of big pot of gold that people just fall into, you know? Yeah. And it's far from the truth, particularly on the criminal end of things, you know? Yeah. Do you find... Any, do you find like the law and the sentencing, there's like discrimination up there? No, well, I can't really go into the sentencing because I'd be disagreeing with a judge then and I'd be getting into trouble over that. But the, um, when you go see a case that the judge will know everything about the case when they're told and they will make the appropriate decision in relation to sentencing, mm. you know? So you don't think there's any inconsistencies based off background classism? Well, when you're looking from the outside, it's very easy to see the inconsistencies. Mm. But if you're sitting, I suppose, on the bench with all the information, I'm sure that the court will make what they think is the right decision, you know? Mm. And if you disagree with the decision, you can always appeal it. Yeah. You know? But it would be unfair to kind of think um, that there's inconsistencies all the time when you don't know anything about the case. Yeah. You know? Valid point. No, it is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I just think there's, like, there's one or two high profile ones, you know, when you look at this situation, what happened, the circumstances, and then you see the sentence. But then you see, like, the culprit, and they have two completely different upbringings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and you're like, well, this was fairly obvious. We've heard this one before, like, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's, I don't know. But I always say to people, if you're unhappy about anything, if you're unhappy about anything, that you make your unhappiness known. You know, if you're unhappy about the water charges, people make their unhappiness known. Mm. If you're unhappy about the law, you make it known to your politician, you know, and see what happens there. But um, when you're when you're sitting down and you're looking at a case and a, a judge, you know, he or she makes a decision, they make the decision based on what's in front of them. The things that we wouldn't see because yeah. we're not involved in the case. So when you walk in and you see a sentence being handed down, yeah, you might know a little bit more when you look at all the information together. So a judge would have everything in front of them, you know. So it's easy for um, people to sit back and say, "Oh, this was right and this was wrong." Um, but it's important to be inquisitive with anything that happens out there. And if you're not happy with it, well, then you speak to government, whether it be the health service, whether it be law, whether it be a judgment. But the um, I don't know about inconsistencies. I say it would be a little unfair for me to talk about that unless I know all about the case, you know? Mm. And even if I did know all about the case, who am I to make a judgment when I'm only there since 2015? Yeah. But like, you know the way they say, like, what's a justice is blind? Mm -hmm. I don't think it sees a bit better with money. It sees a bit better with money. So if I'm rich, you're saying that I might get a better outcome. Well, I don't know about that. Like, you know, I'm not rich. Look at the outcome I had. Absolutely mm. awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, well, I don't. That's just a personal opinion of mine, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. but I that, don't know. You might think different. You but, might but think every, different. But everybody's views are important. Yeah. You know, everybody's views. Are, like I always say, there's three versions of every story. Your like, there's, side, there's, there's your the side. No, there's your side, there's my side, and everybody else's version, like, you know. Mm -hmm. and, the, um, and it's important that people have a view on something. You know, regardless what it is, people have a view and that they express the view, but it has to be an informed view, you know, 
because it's very easy for people. You look at like on Facebook or you look on Twitter and people are commenting about, you know, like I'll be on Twitter and I'll give out about something in a, a shadow of a doubt. You'll look at my Twitter feed, you'll see it. I put a post up today about legal aid fees on my LinkedIn account, you know. So I'm only look I'm only expressing a view based on where I am. Yeah. You know, but I wouldn't dare express a view based on something that I just pulled out of the sky, you know? Because I believe myself open for criticism. I just think it'd be a foolish thing to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, you're, but it's important that you have them views. Yeah. It's important that you, everybody has a view and that everybody lets their view be known, mm. you know? Mm. Right. That's a law and that's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, do you know yeah, man? Who? That, that's a law and that's a fact. What's his name? Do you know what Richard. I was like? Grogan or something, is it? Yeah. Oh, Richard, could you watch Richard Grogan? Yeah. Oh, he's great. Yeah. I think his podcasts are great. You know, absolutely brilliant. Just he the way he's... Podcast. Not the podcast, his sorry. Videos. Just the way, yeah, he does yeah. have these videos. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And just when he's talking about... Let me tell you, I, did, I watch them all the time. Mm. I learn a lot from them as well. I think there's a niche there because he's on... What's he? Uh, employment, employment law. law. Yeah. There's, there's a niche there yeah, for no. criminal law. But the, when you look at a solicitor, like, I mean, uh, like Richard Grogan, like, as long as he's around doing what he's doing, he, like, he's probably a genius. Yeah. yeah. Absolute genius. And I'd be sitting there watching that country I didn't know that. Mm. You know, or you see a newspaper clip and, you know, when they talk about something, you say, I didn't know that, and you keep it, you know? Yeah. And you say, no, I'll, I'll keep that handy in case I need it some time mm. to go off and look at something. But I think he, he's really tapped into the social media aspect. He does question box. Has the game wrapped up. Yeah. So you can just send him whatever you want to know. Or, like, well, what I did find out from his videos is that, like, if you are on annual leave from work, mm -hmm. you book your holidays and you're sick, you got a sick note, you get them days back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fucking deadly. Mm -hmm. but really, imagine, yeah. You could tap into that for criminal law. People can actually send you questions. You can do a 30 second video yeah. answering it. Well, see, what happens with the barrister part is, is that is the, um, the, the client is actually the solicitor's client. Mm. So the solicitor's kind of like a GP, you know. They're, they're brilliant at lots of things, you know. And because they do criminal law, they may pass on the case to you because you kind of specialize in that area or maybe you're a little bit more familiar with that area. So what happens is that the solicitor is my client and then he would say the accused or the injured party is their client, you know? So when people come up to you and say, oh, well, I'll tell you what happened to me last Tuesday, we're like, oh, hold a second, you know? We can't give that view unless we're instructed by a solicitor. They, they would say, Darren, will you do this case for me? And you go, grand, yeah? And uh, then you can advise in it then. But you can't be just there. Uh, like kind of have a questions and answers podcast, you know, because the, we get into trouble over that because we're not briefed in the case. We don't have the the full story behind us where the solicitor would, mm. you know. So we kind of specialise in certain areas. Yeah. You know, so when I say I specialise in criminal law, there's people who be more experienced than me. So if I get something landed on my desk and I'm not too sure, I'll be asking them. Yeah. But I can only uh, um, deal with something that a solicitor instructs me on. Nobody can walk in off the street and say, oh, look, you do this thing for me. They can ask for you. They can go into this and say, look, I want him to do it. But you can only be instructed. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. I get it. I get it, yeah. yeah. But like so Richard Grogan can go on. He can have his, uh, his, his videos. Yeah, they're yeah. great. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Very informative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Learned a lot of things off those. Yeah. You know? And I think he's making the best of social media. He's making it very... Look, you went up and looked after Section 8. He's making the information for people readily available, you know? And uh, I'm sure he'd probably get a lot of work out of it as well, mm. you know. But he's um, it's something he's been doing a long time. Employment law, mm. you know. Yeah. And he's on every show. Pat Kenny, mm. you know, he's on Claire Bourne, yeah. you know. Has it wrapped up? Yeah, no, he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to be the next Richard Grogan. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're wrapping this up. But before we go, don't forget, talking about like live Liberty Hall, Friday, March fourth. Tickets on sale Monday, seventh of February. GoLoudNow.com forward slash events. Sign up for the pre-sale. Doesn't guarantee you a ticket, but does increase your chances. 20 euro excluding book and fee. Get on to it. Take us out, Johnny. Boom. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the GoLoud app. One, two, three, four.